today on the Laura Flanders Show, Art and Revolution. We're in Chicago at the fourth national conference of the organization Insight, where nearly 1,600 women of color from around the country gathered to challenge incarceration, capitalism, and colonialism. We'll speak with writer, organizer, and science fiction scholar Adrian Brown, along with filmmaker, poet, and prison abolitionist Walida Imarisha about their new book, Octavia's Brood, an anthology of radical science fiction written by activists. We'll also hear from one of the book's contributors, political prisoner Mumia Abu-Jamal, calling in from prison. All that and an F word from me on the age of acquiescence, or not. Welcome to our program. We go now to our interview with Walida Imarisha and Adrian Marie Brown, recorded in Chicago. So Adrian, to you, Octavia's brood. Remind us who Octavia is. So Octavia Butler was a black science fiction writer um, who died about nine years ago now. And she wrote story after story featuring protagonists that were young women of color, mostly black women. And these characters practiced leading um, and changing the world in ways that uh, most science fiction has not really played with. And um, we got really inspired by her work. Both of us found that we were just like, oh, she's really taking on social justice issues and how to change the world and what it means to be a human being, what it means to be on this planet or possibly go beyond it um, from a different perspective and a perspective that imbues justice into it. And it feels like she never wanted to be the only person doing that. Um, and so we call ourselves Octavia's Brood. She had a collection that's called Lilith's Brood that talks about this person who basically creates the next phase of humanity. And we see ourselves a little bit as like creating the next phase of this genreless post uh, <laughs> post sci-fi sci-fi uh, and social justice mm. like post-apocalyptic fantasy magical realism myth wonder world. You talk about creating. Uh, well, Lida, you say that all social organizing is science fiction. What do you mean? Yeah, we absolutely believe that all organizing is science fiction. So we think that any time we try to envision a different world, a world without poverty, a world without prisons, a world without capitalism, without war, we are engaging in a practice of science fiction. But we think that when we can dream those realities together, that's when we can begin to build them right here and now in this time. And so we think that our movements for justice are incredibly great at critique, which is wonderful, and we need that, you know. But we also need to be able to offer alternatives. So we know what we don't want. We know what we're fighting against. What do we do want? And I think one of the things we really focus on is the I idea of being unrealistic in our dreams. I think in our organizing, we're often told, you have to go for what's realistic. All social change that's deep and transformative was utterly unrealistic at that time. Well, that's part of what Ursula Le Guin said, and I have to thank you for bringing that um, incredible speech of hers at the Book Awards to my attention in your great piece that you wrote for Bitch Magazine. I'm a subscriber. Yay. She talked about the realists of a bigger reality. Um, and I hadn't realized that realism had been sort of so higher, put in, put in such a higher place in the hierarchy of literature than science fiction. But clearly, it, it's true. Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, I've de I think especially when we're talking about folks who are, you know, radical, progressive, left, whatever we want to call it, um, you know, folks are like, I read, I read nonfiction. I've met many people who are very proud that they only read nonfiction, and I feel very sad for them because, <laughs> yes, we, we have to root ourselves in realities. We're not creating, you know, utopias that have no connection to today, right? The realities we build from are hard and real, but we have to be able to imagine something else. And so I think we, we look to genres like science fiction. Science fiction is the only genre where we don't have to stay contained within what is possible. We can start with the question, what do we want, rather than starting with the question, what is realistic? Mm -hmm. The writing, though, is as powerful as anything I've read. I mean, Octavia Butler's literature is powerful, poignant literature. Um, sometimes I think science fiction gets a bad reputation, not just in content, but also in form. Mm -hmm. uh, but a line from Octavia Butler that sticks with me forever is that line from the parable of the sower where she talks about all you change, all, all, you, all that you touch, you change. And all, all that, that you, you change, change changes you. you. The, the only, only lasting, lasting truth, truth is change. change. God, God is, is change. change. Exactly. It's so good. <laughs> I feel like it's the centerpiece of almost all of the work is 
that so much of how we've been socialized to be human is to resist change, to try to create these institutions, to take over everything and to monetize everything, to put these like limited values on what everyone can look like and be. And then change is actually this constant force that happens and it knocks all of that on its back and it just says there can be something totally different, something you've never imagined. And how do we prepare ourselves as humans to be ready for all that change and to move through that change with grace and with purpose towards what we most care about, what we most long for. And I feel like Octavia's characters have to do that. And I feel like so many of the characters in the stories that we ended up gathering also are figuring that out. Like how do we change if there's no oil to travel from one city to another? How do we change our justice systems? How do we change when gentrification is rampant in our cities? Um, it's an elegant, elegant dance to learn. And how do we throw people on their back. Your character yeah. does that in your story. <laughs> you, you dream Quite literally. Up an, an angel who is, uh, well, a fallen angel, but still an angel. Who, who is she to you, your character? Um, well, I have a friend who says, who's read the majority of my work and says that all of my main characters are grumpy, big-haired black women. So maybe a little autobiographical. Um, but, you know, her name is A, and she is uh, she's an angel who went against God because she couldn't stand to watch humans suffer anymore. And, you know, God said, well, I have a plan. And she said, well, whatever your plan is, I can't, I can't sit by and watch this anymore. And I think for me, a lot of that is about questioning the idea of authority, in this case, the ultimate authority, right? That's going against our moral understanding of what is right. And because of that, God ejects her from heaven, actually sets her on fire, and throws her into the Harlem River, into the Hudson River, and she ends up in Harlem. And becomes a very reluctant superhero. And so, <laughs> that's so great awesome. One. She's so good. A great one. Your yeah. story is about Detroit, where you live. Yeah. I don't want to give away too much of it, but were you able to communicate things in the science fiction writing that you haven't been able to communicate in your organizing? I think so. I mean, I uh, wanted to talk about gentrification in a different way, and I felt like it's this impossible problem. Yeah. And I've seen it no matter, you know, I've lived and worked and I do a bunch of social justice facilitation in different places where it's the one thing that folks are like, we don't really have creative solutions for this. We don't know how to stop it, how to reclaim land, how to hold it. Um, or we can do it for short term periods of time, but you know, what is this longer vision? And there's always this question of like, what would it look like if the people got to develop the community? And I was like, how would we ever get there? And it's, occurred to me that we would need some supernatural help, something else. And um, I've been really obsessed with the idea of what lives in the Detroit River and making it a character. You know, I've heard so many stories about um, people getting pushed into the river during the riots, all the runaway slaves who have crossed that river and live in that river, people who've committed suicide in that river, accidents, burnings, I mean just all this stuff lives in that river and the river has seen all these changes happen and I'm like what if the river has something to say, a point of view that is triggered or in touch with the emotions of that city, the grief of that city, um, it wouldn't be good for those who are trying to gentrify it and I liked that idea, it was exciting to me and my anger had some place to flow um, as I wrote it. It was very healing for me. It's a beautiful piece. Have you always been a writer? I think so. Uh, my mother says so. She, she swears it is true that I was writing as soon as I could put a pen to paper and um, all through my organizing work and social justice facilitation work um, I would always like write on the side and not take it very seriously and it's been such a liberating thing to kind of come into it and be like actually Octavia is an amazing model of someone who did so much to change the world, sitting at a desk, turned inward, feeling awkward about social interactions and not necessarily seeing herself as a leader. And I have, you know, I've been in a lot of leadership positions and never felt really comfortable in them. But I feel so comfortable when I'm writing and I feel so comfortable when I'm letting a story come through. And while Lita and I challenged ourselves to really share our original work and get it out there in the process of asking others to do that. And now it's just, I'm so, like, I feel completely turned on and alive as a writer, mm. yeah. A lot of your contributors, though, were, yeah. Lita, were not people who spent time writing. Some of them first-time writers. Yes. Does it change their sense of themselves? Absolutely. I mean, that was the important piece. We didn't put a call out because we wanted people who would never answer that call. So we did strategic outreach to folks we knew were good writers, but the majority of them had never written fiction, let alone science fiction or visionary fiction. And <clears throat> we got a lot of responses that said, um, I think you sent this email to the wrong person because <laughs> I don't do that. And we're like, that's why we want you, boo-boo. And so we said, just take some time, think about it. And overwhelmingly, when we got back to folks, they had not only incredible ideas, but had already written, you know, 
10, 20, 60 pages of a story. Because again, organizers are sci-fi creators every single day. All we need is the slightest permission to let our imaginations explode because we're holding all of this in. We want these new worlds and we need some space that we can really be thoughtful about what is it we are trying to create. Have these stories in this process given you a new vision of justice? Absolutely. I mean, I think that one of the pieces that I do a lot of work around is prison abolition, is around what can justice look like outside of the context of prisons, outside of police, um, and really rooted in community accountability, healing, um, and uh, you know, restorative ideas of justice. And so many of our pieces touch on that because I think that's a piece that connects with so many other issues and ideas. And I think that this, uh, science fiction is a perfect testing ground, uh, you know, around these issues of justice and alternatives because the vast majority of people can't even imagine a world without prisons. This is a chance to step away from this world and begin to think about it. Mumia Abu-Jamal, the, the uh, journalist and activist, death row inmate in Pennsylvania, has created a place for himself in our consciousness by his work. What I never knew was that he was a Star Trek fan in the yeah. midst of all of this. How'd you find out, Walid? Um, I, yes, I did not think I could love Mumia more, but then that happened. I was like, there it is. Um, so I had, the, I had the honor of being able to go and visit him when I lived in Philadelphia, when he was on death row in Pennsylvania. And you visit through, you know, really thick glass and you talk into phones and so we were talking and I made some Star Trek reference without thinking about it and was like oh no I just outed myself as a nerd to Mumia and Mumia just flowed with it and he was like right live long and prosper I was like what is happening right now and he was like yeah I got you I know um, and so it turns out Mumia is a nerd in all ways which is I think incredible because he really sees the visionary realities and possibilities of science fiction, really seeing the ways that allows us to have difficult conversations like around race, which usually folks would throw up walls and barriers, especially white folks. But if we talk about the green people and the blue people, suddenly <laughs> folks are excited to hear what comes next. So we were lucky enough to have Mumia write an essay about Star Wars and uh, U.S. imperialism and militarism, and he also recorded the audio version of it, so we can play that at events. And you know, it's just amazing to hear him. You know, not only give this brilliant analysis, but also do a, a Darth Vader impression. It's pretty, it's pretty mind-boggling. I was actually reminded of how sort of uh, groundbreaking Star Trek really was when the obituaries were written for Leonard Nimoy. I was. Mm -hmm not somebody who'd really grown up watching Star Trek, except a bit with my dad. Did, did you both grow up watching it? Yeah, I grew up watching. My father was definitely a Trekkie, and I feel like I grew up in an interracial relation. You know, my parents were interracially married in the Deep South in the 70s, and Star Trek was like this um, beautiful like offering from the future of like, oh, there's a time when a lot of this is very different, and the things that right now are getting you um, distance from your family and feeling unsafe in your community just by being in love with each other, maybe that's going to change. And I think that, particularly for my dad, there was some real beauty in that. Mm. Uh, the idea that there would be a place where their love was totally safe and accepted and normal. And you, Walida? Yeah, I actually, my earliest memories of a Star Trek, I am uh, watching a Star Trek episode. Um, Little baby Walida. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a great one. But, you know, you have to start somewhere. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I actually um, uh, taught myself Klingonese when I was, uh, you know, Klingon language when I was. So it was very much a, an important part of who I was. And I think, you know, when I became politicized, when I began doing organizing, I thought I had to put that part of me to the side. Yeah. And it wasn't until, you know, I engaged with folks like Adrian and other people like um, Jordan Flaherty from Left Turn Magazine, Morgan Phillips, that I realized, oh, I can actually pull all of these pieces together. I don't have to separate out my nerd self from my organizing self. And actually, not only do they go together, they, they need each other, yeah. right? We need, our nerds need our organizers, our organizers need our nerds, and we definitely need those folks who are both. Well, yeah. I know a lot of people are probably knowing, thinking right now that they need a copy of your book, Octavia's Brood. Yes. How do they get it, and how do they get in touch with you? So, octaviasbrood.com is the sort of central hub to go to find out everything about where to order the book, where to go see us on tour. Um, and right now, the best place or place we're recommending to go buy it is actually through AK Press. AK Press had recently had a horrible fire. They did. And luckily, our books were, our pallets had not moved to the storage location yet where they would have been in damage by that fire. 
but there was a lot of damage done and they are trying to recover. So we are encouraging folks that they can donate anything to support um, and help them get back on their feet. They're, they're amazing, they do amazing work. We need the books that AK does. So we're really honored to be a part of their, their family. They were our dream publisher. They were, so it's, yeah. We're like, Doo -doo. you guys want us too? Oh my gosh. Well, okay. Thank you both. Octavia's Brood is available now. We'll put a link at our website. I want to thank Walida and Adrian for coming in. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so thank much, Laura. It's always great to see you. Journalist Mumia Abu Jamal is currently serving a life sentence in Pennsylvania for murder of a police officer. Charges his supporters say were fabricated because of his political acts. According to his wife, Mumia is currently in dire health and not receiving proper medical care. In this exclusive excerpt from the book Octavia's Brood, Mumia Abu-Jamal discusses Star Trek, Star Wars, and U.S. Empire. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. When Star Wars premiered in 1977, it swept the nation like a fever. Lines circled blocks, and before long, it was more than a movie. It was a craze. TV commercials hawked wares and blazed with Star Wars figures available from McDonald's. Get yours now. Before all was said and done, the movie grossed nearly half a billion dollars. That's billions with a B. I was, however, out of the loop. In 1977, I was in my 23rd year of life, and the targeted demographic was pre-teen and teen rather than post-teen. Besides, I was more of a Star Trek guy. And it didn't hurt that one of the stars of the Trekkie universe was a black beauty who blazed the screen like a dark, luscious comet every time she appeared. To the uninitiated, I here refer to actress Michelle Nichols, who performed as Lieutenant Uhura of the Trek bridge crew. That said, I watched with fascination as the lines grew and other film companies tried to copy the money-making magic of the Star Wars franchise. They usually fail miserably, however. Why did Star Wars strike such a deep and jangling nerve? Why did it become a craze? One would seem to surprise everyone, critics, the movie's executives, all it seemed, except producer George Lucas. The nation had just recently been forced to submit to a seemingly uncivilized, as in low-tech enemy, and it faced the generational rebellion of the 60s. The Vietnam syndrome permeated the culture, not just the political elites. The younger were virtually uniformly anti-war in their orientation, and a counterculture was sweeping the nation, changing dress, hairstyles, sexual mores, food consumption, and the way national minorities both were perceived and perceived themselves. In short, the land was in the midst of a cultural and political rebellion, sparked in large part by resistance to an unpopular war. An American president, Nixon, recently resigned several months after his vice president top aides including the attorney general john mitchell were sent to prison the human detritus of what would become the watergate scandal in this context why would a movie even one set in another world find appeal when the heroes were the ragtag bunch of rebels decidedly low-tech fighting against a fearsome militarily invincible empire Part of Star Wars' success was its undeniable youth appeal, yet there must be deeper reasons for its cultural resonance. America, the Empire, didn't like its role, at least among the young. It wanted to reimagine itself as the ragtag band, fighting against great odds, against an evil empire. It imagined itself as it wanted to be, as it claimed to be in its infancy against a cruel and despotic king, of the late 18th century. It reshaped itself into the rebels, not the imperial overlords. It shaped itself as oppressed, fighting for freedom. But America, like every nation, has its ages of psychosis. It has fits of indecision and periods of self-delusion. Consider how American presidents spoke movingly of freedom from tyranny while holding personally hundreds of men, women, and children in slavery. Or imagine Jefferson, the sage of Monticello, who was the father of half black children, at the same moment as he wrote in his only book, Notes on the State of Virginia, 
that black people were essentially non-human, a species related to the orangutan. I mean, does this mean that he saw himself as being in the bestiality? Or did this mean he really thought his children were, well, half monkey? Americans, like any people, are subject to delusions. Was this fascination with Star Wars and the national identification with the rebels one of them? For generations, Americans have declined to define themselves as imperialists. That's what our enemies called us. That wasn't what we called ourselves. We were for freedom. We were for self-determination. We were good. We were white, mostly. We were Luke Skywalker, not Darth Vader, and definitely not the cruel, warped Emperor. Yet aficionados of the Star Wars saga know that Luke and Darth were, after all, intimately related. Darth's infamous line at their lightsaber battle has become a cultural byword, I am your father, Luke. It is a measure of Lucas's genius that he scripts that moment of self-realization, of self-discovery, and of revelation. In the grisly aftermath of a war that tore millions from the face of Asia, all to cover for the corporate exploitation of Vietnam's bauxite and other natural resources, the Imperial Shock Trooper, the Imperial Metallic Death's Hand, was father to the Rebel. They were, in fact, more than related. In truth, they were one. That is the meaning of Star Wars. We were Rebels. We are Empire. And like all rebellious children, we were but going through a phase. We're getting ready for adulthood after we sowed a few wild oats. Once grown, we put on our imperial uniform and bow to the Empire. It is your destiny, right? Unless... From somewhere, maybe on the Enterprise, this is Mumia Abu-Jamal. These commentaries are recorded by Noel Hanrahan of Prison Radio. That was journalist and sci-fi fan Mumia Abu-Jamal in audio recorded last year from a prison in Pennsylvania. A new book just out on the Gilded Age calls ours an age of acquiescence. We've become a nation of acceptors, its author argues, willing to tolerate corporate crime and public poverty as inevitable outcomes of a system that is rigged. The current public debate, author Stephen Fraser suggests, reflects a resignation that market capitalism is bedrock, unchangeable, simply the way things are. A century after an age of organized resistance to the rise of corporate power between the Civil War and the Depression, we today have become wusses by comparison. In the late 19th century, wealth was just as condensed. The richest 1% owned 51% of the wealth, while the bottom 44 owned 1.1. But theirs was an age of sit-down strikes and rebellion. Troops, not just city cops, routinely hit the streets. So what happened? As followers of our program know at the Laura Flanders Show, we don't believe there's so much resignation. There's more rising going on than our money media show. Still, there is truth in Fraser's case that 19th century unrest was fueled in part by a different frame of reference. To 19th century factory workers, the age of alienation was new. Descendants of subsistence farmers and self-employed craftsmen and artisans, they chafed at log-in, log-out labor, wage slavery, they called it. When I asked a class of college students recently what they understood that term to mean, a room of blank faces stared back at me. We live in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable, science fiction writer Ursula Le Guin said upon receiving a National Book Award for Literature last fall. But then, she continued, so did the divine right of kings, which is why there's much to celebrate in the publication of Octavia's Brood, an anthology of visionary science fiction written by organizers and activists. While the 19th century's rabble could rely more than we can on memory, the 21st century's needs radical sci-fi, as the editors put it, to decolonize the brain. 
You can watch my interview with Walida Imarisha and Adrian Mary Brown, the editors of Octavia's Brood, as well as our report on the Insight Conference in Chicago this week on The Laura Flanders Show. I'm Laura Flanders. Write to me. Tell me what you think. Laura at GritTV.org. And thanks. This week on the show, Stacy Mitchell and Esteban Kelly. One of the challenges that we have in the U.S. is that we're a little bit hypnotized by our economy. Part of the problem is that uh, when capitalism becomes synonymous with patriotism or with America, um, as opposed to democracy, then we've seeded a lot. And then we get a glimpse of the great invisible. This is what they call hard luck city. The function of law enforcement in the United States is um, to police uh, the lines or perimeters, as you would say, around sex and gender and around sex and sexuality as much as they are around race. And in fact, that the policing of sex and gender is an integral function of the policing of race and poverty. Now, we're told 48-year-old Powell was serving a 27-month sentence for prostitution. Oh.